subsidized purchase of insurance and exchange. The threshold for any requirement in the Affordable Care Act on the business side is 50. If you're 51 and above, the mandate applies to you. If you're 50 and below, the mandate does not apply to you. So all those small businesses screaming, you know, the earth, freedom, American appetite is going to end as we know it because of the Affordable Care Act, right? What are they talking about? They don't have to do nothing. All right? One of the bills making it to the Supreme Court, one of the Sui, Sewer, whatever, plaintiffs, whatever the guys are, right? The National Federation of Independent Businesses, those are the guys who represent the small businesses. They're suing, right? Now you want to scratch your head and say, why are they suing? You aren't required to do squat. Chamber of Commerce stands up for the small businesses, same thing. They actually did sign out for one, but there are, they're pretty hostile to the bill. They don't have to do nothing. The mandate doesn't apply to them. Washington loves small business. We would never do anything nasty like make them pay their fair share of employee coverage. So this idea that they somehow have to offer money to go into the exchange, no. You got 35 employees, you're staying at 35 employees. Responsibility required. That's the legal. The mandate for employers, let's be honest, applies to large employers, 51 or more, full-time employees, and at least one full-time employee who receives a premium tax credit. So, You've got 51 employees, or I'll say you've got 100 employees. The penalty occurs only if someone who could get insurance from you goes into the exchange. Right? But, and, and the tax, by the way, is $2,000 per full time employee, excluding the first 30 employees. So if you've got 100 employees, you're paying that $2,000. Only on the seventh, not on the full time. Okay? That's if you don't offer coverage. So, if you've got 100 employees, you can decide $2,000 per employee penalty. So, I get hit with 70, that's a $140,000 penalty. See that math? 2,000 times 70. That would be my penalty if I had 100 employees. And they go into the exchange and get their insurance. You have to say, is that worth it or not worth it? Well, the question is, how much am I paying on insurance now? And how much could I get away with saving if I give them money so that they can go into the exchange? That's the kind of calculation employers are going to make. If you do offer coverage and someone leaves, you have a penalty lesser of a fee of $20,000 per full-time employee who goes in, excluding the person who leaves, or a fee of $3,000 per full-time employee receiving a premium credit. So if you've got an employee, like a secretary, who decides she's going into the exchange, you're going to have to pay $3,000. All right. Responsibility requirements. That's the legal. The mandate for employers, let's be honest, applies to large employers, 51 or more, full-time employees, and at least one full-time employee who receives a premium tax credit. So, you've got 51 employees, or I'll say you've got 100 employees. The penalty occurs only if someone who could get insurance from you goes into the exchange. Right? But, and, and the tax, by the way, is $2,000 per full-time employee, excluding the first 30 employees. So if you've got 100 employees, you're paying that $2,000 only on the seventh, not on the full time. Okay? That's if you don't offer coverage. So, if you've got 100 employees, you can decide $2,000 per employee penalty. So, I get hit with 70, that's a $140,000 penalty. See that math? 2,000 times 70, that, that would be my penalty if I had 100 employees. And they go into the exchange and get their insurance. You have to say, is that worth it or not worth it? Well, the question is, how much am I paying on insurance now? 
other coverage, and someone leaves, you have a penalty lesser of a fee of twenty thousand per full-time employee who goes in, excluding the person who leaves, or a fee of three thousand per full-time employee receiving a premium credit. So if you've got an employee like a secretary who decides she's going in for the exchange, you're going to have to pay three thousand dollars. Got it? That's the mandate. So if you are in the 50 to 100 employee range, you've got your first 30 you don't pay a penalty on. You pay a penalty on the rest, and then you have to see how much you save. It's a sort of simple calculation. Above 100, what do we know about employee, employers above 100? Or above 200? We're already at 98, 99% of them already offer insurance. Right? This isn't going to change one. It might change. Well, they'll say, listen, I want to stop off of insurance going to the exchange. But then they're just paying a penalty and shifting money from one pocket to another. But fundamentally, they're not really affected. So on the employer side, it's hard to hear what people are so upset about. Right? If you're a big employer, you're already offering insurance. This doesn't affect you. You're a small employer, you don't get a penalty. And you're in that in between 50 to 100, you decide. Now, if you're 75 employees or 100 employees and you're not offering insurance, this is going to make a difference. But if you're 75, 100 employees and you're not offering insurance, there's something wrong. Right? And then the question is why shouldn't we make you offer insurance if we're going to keep an employer based coverage system? So, I have to say, I always scratch my head about the business being upset about this bill. They are treated so incredibly gentle. Remember, the bills in the 90s were all with filled with employer mandates. It was employers who were going to have to do it, not individuals. Now, let me tell you the one situation in which employers might have a, quote, complaint. What do we know about what's happened in Massachusetts relative to employers? Let me rephrase that question. Who's one of our working people? Raise your hand. You're a worker. Okay. What's crowd out? So crowd out is you've got a government program and it crowds out the private sector for doing something. That's crowd out. So, if I offer a public program and an employer was offering that public program, they will drop it and send their people to the public program. I'm crowding out the private sector initiatives. Right? There's a worry. We've got a public program, we've got insurance exchanges, we've got subsidies. We're going to crowd out employer sponsored insurance. They're going to drop it. It's possible. Some will. For sure, how many indeterminate. What happened in Massachusetts when they offered their mandate and their exchange? There was crowd in. What's crowd in? Crowd in means government program. And by the way, more businesses had to start offering health insurance than did before. By the existence of the public program, actually business had to do more. So one worry here from a business standpoint is, my workers might come to me and say, you know, there's a mandate. I've got to get insurance. You better offer insurance to me. And then work companies will have to start offering insurance. That could be your one worry if you're an employer, that there will suddenly be crowd in. It did happen in Massachusetts. Whether it's a common, will turn out to be common, pretty unknown. But I would also say, pretty rare in most government programs to have crowd in. Typical government programs you have crowd out. You create a public program, business stops offering, stops doing what they were doing before with that in that same area. So if there's any legitimacy to the business complaint about this bill, the one area where there might be legitimacy is suddenly their workers will come to them and say, hey, start offering insurance when you didn't before. We'll see. Uh, now, uh, most employers have an opt-in policy, which is 
University of Pennsylvania says, here are your insurance options, fill out a form, and we'll sign you up for health insurance and pay our part of the bill and charge you for your part of the bill. The bill says if you've got 200 or more employees, you now have to enroll them. If they don't sign up for something, you have to give them a plan with the option to opt out. What's this meant to reduce? Opting in requires me to do something. I've got to fill the damn form out. I've got to choose with insurance company. There's a potential energy barrier for new chemists and new meds, right? I gotta do something. So that's why opt-in means you get a lower rate of people doing something. If I something's been done to me, I'm already enrolled, and I have to take an initiative to get out, right? I won't take that initiative by and large. Some people will, but fewer will. So you'll get more people, the status quo buyers, who are, you know, they're signed up and they'll just go along. So you don't get people who miss this. Does that, does that work? Does that opt-in, opt-out thing work? Or is that just fancy economic theory that turns out to be wrong in practice? Works hugely. How do we know? Where's the actual real-life example? Pensions. This is a case of behavioral economics taking a role in the Affordable Care Act. All right. Medicaid and CHIP are expanded. Everyone, they get their coverage under 133% of the FBL, about $29,000 for a family of four. So if you're poor, you go into Medicaid. The newly eligible will be guaranteed a plan that meets the essential health benefits through the exchange. Initially, states were very hostile to this. Why? On average, what proportion of the Medicaid bill do they pay? Remember, Medicaid is a federal state matching program. Federal government pays X percent, and states have to pay Y percent. Federal government on average pays 57 percent, which means states are paying 43 percent. On average, varies by state. Very complicated formulas. So this sweetened the pot to states and said, listen, initially, I think it's for the first three years, we're taking 100% of the bill. Every, people, every person you add, and then it goes down to 90% by 2020. There is a provision, what's called a maintenance of effort provision, which means states can suddenly, in 2012, say, shoot, we're getting rid of everyone on Medicaid purchase rolling back our eligibility requirements so that in 2014 the federal government has to come in and cover all these people. So there was a there's provisions in the bill called maintenance of effort. States have to maintain the effort that they've been making in this area. This is souped up. What is the impact of this kind of deal politically? Those states which have had very restrictive eligibility requirements other, up till now, they get this huge benefit. If you believe in continuity of care and things like that, not a good system. Why did we do this? It's all about the money. It's not rational policy. We needed a low bill. We needed to have low costs on the total bill. So rather than have everyone in the exchange, that would have been too expensive because private insurance is more expensive than Medicaid. You do it this way. It's going to create a huge amount of churn, and no one's 100% sure how the system is going to handle it, what it's going to do to continuity of care, etc. This is the subsidy schedule of people above 133%. Hold on one second. Above 133%, above $29,000 for a family of four, going up to $88,000. 89,400. They get subsidies or tax credits to buy insurance in the exchange. So insurance costs $15,000, and we'll see you soon what it's going to cost. This is how much you get in addition to buy the coverage. This one, this, sorry, this, the graph doesn't tell you how much you get. What the graph says is, 
the maximum amount you have to spend of your income to buy insurance, 2%. So say you're at 150% of the federal poverty line, okay? You're making $33,525 for a family of four, okay? You have to pay $4% of that, roughly $1,200, $1,500 for your insurance. Everything above that is going to be covered by the tax credit. At the top end, at 400%, so you make 89,000, you have to spend about 70, about $8,500 for insurance. Everything above that is going to be paid for. You're at 500% of the federal poverty line, over $100,000. Your employer doesn't provide coverage, you have to pay for all. But you can see the subsidy schedule, there's a huge effort uh, put in to keep what people pay until you got to the high end below a significant amount of money. In addition, because there are deductibles and co-pays with private insurance, there are efforts in the bill to increase even more so that people um, uh, get more subsidy for uh, uh, take, take care of the co-pays. That's to reduce the cost sharing. Now, if small business decides, that is, with 25 employees or less, decides to offer health coverage, there's also a subsidy schedule for that. If you look at this subsidy schedule carefully, you will find out that it's not that hot to hot. So if you have 25 employees and an average annual wage of less than 50,000, so spread out over your employees, that purchase health insurance. So you're not that 35 employee group we asked you about before, excluded. You have to have 25 or less. Your average wage is in the low end, below the median of 50,000. You get a tax credit up to 35% of the employer's contribution towards the premium. So if the employer says, oh, thank you, sorry. I'm going to pay 5,000 bucks, 35% of that, okay, about 1,700 bucks, is given to the employer as a tax credit. Later it goes up to 50%, but only for two years. So it's an exploding credit. So you can only select in the exchange from a qualified health plan. Those are ones that offer the essential benefits. The essential benefits are a provision in the bill. We had a complicated way of determining the essential benefits. The Institute of Medicine was going to report. The HHS was going to do a survey of small businesses. And then HHS was supposed to come up with, here are the essential benefits. What did HHS do? State decides. What's that mean? That means some states will decide essential benefits one way, another state will decide essential benefits another way. You've got a hodgepodge. Really dumb choice. I cannot tell you why they did it that way. They had an easy political choice, which is essential benefits, those are things that Congress can get. Whatever's in the federal employee health benefit plan, that's what's going to be an essential benefit. Is it perfect? No. Is it easy to sell to the public? Yes. Why they went this other way, Lord knows. Uh, in the exchanges, there have to be four levels. Bronze level at the bottom, silver, gold, platinum at the top. That's percentages on how much of the expected health care bill the health insurance covers. The, the subsidy is marked to the silver plan. 